I am in Russia, and these are reindeer, wild or barely domesticated members of the deer family, symbols of the far north and of the Sami people. Can withstand temperatures as low as minus 40 degrees thanks to their thick insulating coats. I have a date with the noblest of this region's animals. It is crowned by a pair of antlers which can grow up to 1.3 meters and it has been semi-domesticated by Arctic tribes. Still bred by a few dozen Samis, reindeer also make exceptional athletes. In Lover Zero, I plan to go to the Festival of the North, famous for its reindeer races. But first, I had to travel to the world's northernmost city, Murmansk. I'm in Murmansk, and because of the condensation, all the cars are smoking as if they had holes in their exhaust pipes. Lada power. Hello. I've always wanted to come here because it is a symbol of the far north, the gateway to the Arctic. Spasiba. There are men on the roof. Murmansk station with its red star. There are quite a few trains in Russia. But it really is quite different from back home. I feel a bit isolated here. People don't speak much English. It's not that easy to find your bearings. The layout is quite geometric, but I can't read Cyrillic, so I don't have a clue about street names. Can I come? Remy. Hey, you. Alexander. Alexander. <laughs> Excellent. Are you here for the Festival of the North? No, for a documentary about reindeer. Lover Zero. Oh, reindeer. Right. <laughs> I'm going to find a viewpoint to see the city from above, to see how it's organized. I can see that there is water and there are towers, but I can't figure out the layout of the city. Ah, more dogs. Dogs everywhere. So you're the guard here, are you? You're a very cuddly guard. <laughs> To the south lies Moscow, to the east lies Siberia and Kamchatka, and on the Kola Peninsula I'm going in search of an animal that links humans with nature, the reindeer. Right, I'm off to the museum. I think there are more animals to see there than in the city. Remy! The city's regional museum contains a huge display of stuffed animals, a menagerie fixed in supposedly natural positions. This is apparently the only place where I can see a reindeer in Mamansk. Wow, it's very big. Eh? This is the male, no? With the big antlers. This. Yes, uh, some females have antlers too. Okay, very impressive. They have very broad hooves. These reindeer are from the forest. They haven't really been domesticated and they have brown coats, whereas the semi-domesticated reindeer from the tundra are more grey and white. People who, who live in the city all year long, uh, do they have a special feeling about these species that is very, very related to human beings in this region? Yes, of course. They are emblematic of the tundra and of the north in general. Symbol. There's a festival here called the Festival of the North. Everyone brings their reindeer and we organize races. Then sometimes we can see reindeer around Murmansk. But if I want to see more reindeers, I have to go into the wild. Yes, to the tundra where the herds are. Reindeer may be rare in Murmansk, but that is not the case for certain birds which have adapted to the cold, such as gulls. They gather in Kola Bay, near the fishing port. To find out more, I have arranged to meet Anastasia, who studies their sometimes overpowering populations. She is going to tell me more about these birds, which constitute some of the rare examples of wildlife in this city. Then do we see the, the girls from here? or? This is where the gulls are most likely to nest. Ah, but they are on the roofs. Ah, okay, I understand, I understand. Okay. 
I get it now. The gulls we see flying around the city actually nest on rooftops. That must be the case in lots of cities around the world. And it's plain to see here. If you look hard, you can see that they are spread over every square meter across the rooftop. Every chimney and satellite dish is taken over by pairs of gulls in the nesting season. They attack each other if they overpass the limit. How does it work? Yes, absolutely. Because some, some biologists or ornithologists call the gulls crows from the sea, sea crows. Yes, they do sometimes prey on one another. When they are hungry, they might even steal the eggs from neighboring nests. Cannibalism. Yes, but that's very rare. The birds seem to be everywhere above our heads, both in the air and nesting on buildings. Commensal species are species which profit from another species. In this case, the human race, without harm in it. They don't cause us any direct harm. They don't attack us, like in a Hitchcock movie, but they live among us, on our rooftops, and feed off our rubbish. Anastasia has something in her apartment she wants to show me. Hello. It's here? Oh! <laughs> now there's a surprise. I really love birds, huh? For, for rescuing uh, a hurted ghoul and uh, give her, like, your own kitchen. Like, it's a, it's a proof of love, no? no At first, we were only going to keep it for three days. Then we thought it might be more like two months. But then it became longer because it transpired that rehabilitating this bird before releasing it was very difficult. Restoring its plumage in the apartment is virtually impossible. This makes me smile because the only other person I know who has a gull in his apartment is Gaston Legaff, who has a cat and a gull. I just saw a beautiful white cat here too. So it's like being in Gaston's apartment. It's really fascinating to discover the city's hidden wildlife. Murmansk gets its name from the Sami word, Mormon, meaning edge of the earth. Living on a partially frozen fjord can't always be easy. They probably owe their strength of character to the harshness of their environment, which freezes over for more than eight months out of 12. Their personalities reflect those of the gulls, or sea pirates, from the northern seas who have had to adapt to tough living conditions. The strength of spirit in these places is undeniable. I'm finally leaving Mamansk to explore wilder stretches, away from the buildings and the traffic. I'm heading for the tundra and the remote village of Teraburka, tiny ports on the glacial Arctic Ocean. I met Yuri thanks to various contacts, and he has offered to show me around the tundra. There is wildlife here that has adapted to what are extremely harsh conditions for a good part of the year. The vegetation is very sparse and short because the soil is poor and there isn't much rainfall. There is a dampness because there isn't much evaporation, but it doesn't rain much, so the tallest trees in the tundra, where we are headed, are only 40 centimetres tall. Ah, OK. OK. Ah, OK. This is reindeer lichen. Reindeer lichen. Do you think it's the only form of life, of biodiversity, that I can find here in the northern line of, of Russia? Come with me. Yeah? Uh, I will show you. OK. Ah. Uh, here we are, on the edge of the world in the far north of the Kola Peninsula. Yuri has brought me here because he knows I like birds, and in the water there are some extraordinary ducks, Arctic ducks, Eiders, common Eiders, Stella's Eiders, long-tailed ducks. Being a bird lover, I've dreamt of seeing these ducks ever since I was a boy. They nest even further north and come here in winter to escape the ice flows. They are all diving ducks and can spend several minutes underwater. Despite the fact that my fingers, feet, nose and ears are freezing cold, I'm so excited to be here. I'm here in the far north of the Kola Peninsula. 
To the west lies Norway, to the east Siberia, to the south Moscow, and to the north, the Arctic Pole. The climate here is one of the world's harshest, despite the fact that thanks to the Gulf Stream, the ocean remains free of ice sheets. It feels like a ghost port, once flourishing in the time of the USSR, when it had several thousand inhabitants, this coastal town was abandoned at the end of the Cold War. But perhaps that exodus is what makes this place so magical. It feels like the end of the earth, where boats come to die. People tell me that only herds of reindeer cross this icy plain now, trampling the permafrost underfoot in search of food. If I am to find them, I must continue on my way. Yuri goes his way and I go mine, guided by the moon. I hitchhike and I'm greeted by passing trains. I sleep a little and then push on again in temperatures of minus 20 degrees. The further south I walk, the colder it gets. As I head for Karelia, I pass from the tundra to the taiga, or boreal forest another mythical ecosystem covering stretches of still protected land. I plan to spend two days in the wilds of Lapland, which has several large natural parks. This must be it. Usually, large nature reserves like this have a reception or information desk, and that's where I'm meant to be meeting a team of scientists, including one named Alexander, who's going to take me into the heart of this Lap nature reserve. Bonjour, Rémy. Bonjour. Do you speak French? Alexander. That's me. Alexander. And this is Anatoly. Serge. And Serge. Serge or Sergei? Anatoly, Serge. Serge, Anatoly. Alexander. Alexander. Okay. Go. Spasiva. For your information. The northern taiga and the tundra consists of marshes, rivers, mountain streams and lakes. There are 32 species of mammals and 205 varieties of birds. At least, that's how many have been recorded so far. I've come from Mamansk, from the city, and I know nothing about the wildlife on the Kola Peninsula. He's just explaining that there is the tundra and the taiga further south. There are areas where human activity has pushed back nature, but he is also explaining that the harsh conditions of the far north mean that there are very few animals anyway, even where there is quite a wide diversity. His job is to protect it and explain it to people. It's so interesting to be here in the wilds of Russia. I have a better understanding now, after looking at the map. Well, now I want to, to see this nature. Let's go. Of course. Uh, but you're not properly dressed for it. Okay. It's cold here, with the snow and the wind. You'll be cold on the snow bike. I want this color. <laughs> yeah, take this ski suit. Okay. okay. This, he says I'm ill-equipped. <laughs> These guys are tough. Tak. Right, I'll just follow him. Travelling to a remote isba from the reception at the nature reserve takes an hour and a half by snow bike along a frozen river. Alex, my guide, has promised to reveal some hidden secrets about the vast forests surrounding us. That's a swan's nest. You have to imagine the area as a sort of marsh where the swans have found a small island to build their nest on, away from predators. I'm guessing that in three or four months there will be swans' eggs here, with a swan sitting on them. I've come here for the reindeer racing season. Winter is the best time for me to witness this activity that humans share with reindeer. But the wildlife is far more elusive now than it would be in the summer. I'm worried we won't see many species of wildlife. But there are traces. He tells me a swan is building its nest here. And there are signs that a bear has been here too. What's this? A wolverine? A wolverine was here, but in winter it is hard to spot the animals.
Yeah. It's a male, a male crossbill. These birds are typical of the boreal forest. Look, Remy, over there. Hoof prints of an elk. These are fresh tracks made by an elk. These are an elk's hoof prints. You can see two long claws here, and that's the back of the hoof. Amazing. This is great. <laughs> what do you think about the relation between Russian people, population, and this beautiful and very rich nature. Well, the Russians love nature. Factory workers and soldiers go off into nature really whenever they get the chance. Green tourism has really been developed here recently. Spending time in nature is a great escape. People don't hunt or fish or do activities. They just observe nature. And that's great. Are Russians going back to nature, then? Alex assures me that they are. That may be the case, but nature doesn't offer up her riches to order. We have spent the whole day looking for animals, but we have drawn a blank. Night is already falling, and we find consolation in the northern lights, formed by particles of solar wind. We must persevere. Let us hope that tomorrow some wild reindeer will finally decide to reveal themselves. I can see, amazing. They don't see us. And it's important to be under the wind, like. Yeah, the wind's in the right so direction. they can't smell us? They can't smell us or hear us. The, the elk and the reindeer, they, they meet each other sometimes into the wild. Lapland. In Lapland, they do. Elks spend winter in the pine forests where there's less snow. So they can still find food. Since reindeer feed off lichen, they share the same territory. <laughs> And they never fight uh, between each other? <laughs> no. It's rewarding going in search of animals in the far north. You can't walk through the snow here. I hadn't realized that. A few days ago, I was still in France, and now I'm here in the wilds of the Arctic. Without Alex, I would never have seen the wild elks here. I'm blessed. Thank you for this gift. The wild reindeer remained hidden in the depths of the taiga, but seeing wild elks, their giant cousin, was a real treat. The males can weigh up to 700 kilograms and are the largest members of the deer family. They are mainly adapted to the marshes strewn across the taiga in summer, so they struggle with the snow. That's why you don't find them any further north than the Kola Peninsula. On the shores of the White Sea in Kandalaksha, another treasure awaits me. It's a fish which produces black gold, caviar. In the Caspian Sea, much further south, the birthplace of caviar production. Wild sturgeons have become so rare due to overfishing that they are now protected. Certain species are now farmed in captivity in Italy, France and China, and since relatively recently, Russia. These iron tanks are vast. Look at the trolleys passing by. Right, they're full of fish to feed the sturgeons. They're enormous, gigantic. These ones weigh up to 500 kilograms, but sturgeons can be much heavier than that. They have heads like sharks, and yet they are bony fish? You can see the bony plates on their skin. They look like dinosaurs. They really are impressive creatures. At which age you kill them to get the eggs? 
We don't kill them. We have a method which allows us to remove the caviar without killing the fish. This is a this is sustainable method. It's actually a surgical operation. You can harvest the female's eggs without killing her. I didn't realize you could do that. I have only ever seen people fishing for sturgeons in Iran, Russia, and even where I live in the southwest of France, in the Gironde. There they kill the females, and so the males were killed too, for no reason, because you have to open up the fish to find out the sex. They don't kill the fish here, they're reared in captivity, and the females spawn several times. Uh, how many times they can uh, get uh, pregnant to have eggs, and then you get these eggs how many times in their lives? With this technique, we can harvest the eggs a minimum of four or five times, but they don't spawn every year. You have to wait two or three years between each pregnancy. At what age uh, they start to produce eggs? In captivity, we hope to harvest the first eggs when there are eight. But in the wild, it's more like 12. My first sturgeon. It's amazing. It really is bony. And this protective film covering them is strange. Okay. It's so slippery. I mustn't keep it out of the water for long. I just wanted to show you its morphology. And uh, what do they eat? Bentofagi. Ah, OK, they eat benthos. Benthos, or benthic fauna, are the invertebrates found in the silts and the sand on the riverbed. Sturgeons are carnivorous, but they eat microorganisms. Time to let it go. There. So beautiful. They have a nice colour, eh? a bit blue, bluish. Weighing up to 200 kilograms and measuring about three meters in the wild, Siberian sturgeons are reared in fish farms to save the wild ones from being killed. In these tanks, the fish are often less than 1.5 meters long, and the adults weigh about 65 kilograms. White Sea, which flows into the Arctic Ocean, is a haven for species from the pole, cetaceans, seals, and birds. The ice melts here in spring, but there is still time for me to cross it in search of wildlife. In Shupa, on the shores of the White Sea, I get the opportunity to go diving with a beluga whale named Vara. The Latin name for this species is Delphinaturus, meaning dolphin without fins, because they have no dorsal fins. Some scientists think this makes it easier for them to swim under the ice. Vara has been isolated for the purposes of research. In the spring, she will be joined by them and allowed to develop in more agreeable surroundings and eventually, I hope, be released back into the sea. Maria, you know for me it's a bit surprising to find the beluga in captivity. Uh, is it unique? Uh, because I, I never saw that. No, she's not the only one. Beluga whales adapt extremely well to living in captivity and they live a long time. They are the friendliest, most peaceful and slowest of dolphins. That is why they are so great with divers. Some dolphins are more reticent when they come into contact with humans, but beluga whales don't hold back. They are much more communicative than some other dolphins, and their rhythms suit those of humans.
Vara is a three-year-old beluga whale. Beluga whales are born grey, and then they grow lighter with age. The young females become adults between the ages of five and seven, and for the males, between six and nine, they turn completely white when they reach sexual maturity. As adults, they can weigh up to one and a half tons. The historical relationship between men and beluga in the Arctic Russian. Arctic Russia is mainly populated by indigenous people, such as the Chukchis or Yakuts. A beluga whale would feed a whole village. Could we say that beluga is the reindeer of the sea? No, beluga whales are not really like a reindeer, because reindeer are semi-domesticated. Humans and reindeer have a symbiotic relationship because humans help reindeer and reindeer feed humans. Beluga whales are wild, independent animals who have no need of humans. I never imagined that a cetacean would be so eager to approach a human being. Of course, they are naturally gregarious, sociable creatures because they live in groups. This one has been living in isolation for several months now, so she's probably a bit lonely. She's waiting for some other beluga whales to join her as part of a scientific research program. It's quite touching, seeing her look at me, call to me and invite me into her world. I'm back on the reindeer trail and I'm just entering Sami territory. These indigenous people have always placed reindeer at the center of their culture. There's nothing like a bit of hitchhiking to help me reach these Laplanders still living in the heart of the peninsula. Why you go to Lavozero? I go to Lavozero because there is the reindeer. Alieni. Alieni. Alieni race, you know? Uh-huh. The I I racing. Go, I go to Lavozero too. Okay, race. for the... Alienia. Okay. If you want, I have in Lavozero, I have a friend. Uh, I can give you some contacts and you Call yeah. him and uh, maybe he help you. Okay. He uh, yes. before racing. I was with doing racing the with the reindeer. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. That's good news. Here I am in reindeer country at last. I even have the number of a sleigh driver in Lover Zero. But first, a more modest encounter on the edge of a remote forest. Wow, I can see the track down there. I'm not equipped like a reindeer. Reindeer hooves are like snowshoes, so they don't sink into the snow. I can see the smoke rising over there. That must be where they're waiting for me. I'll never get there. Okay, good. I can see something over there. This is great. Uliana. Remy. <laughs> Is this it? Uh-huh. Reindeer farmers Boris and Juliana welcome me into their home. There are reindeer everywhere, which is great because I can't wait to finally get close to them. This is a crazy world. There are people still carving out a life for themselves in the tundra. It's still possible. <laughs> The Russian Hat Brigade. We're off to see reindeer. This is great. When it's too hilly, he says, get out. I'll drive down on my own and you can follow. Nice. Amazing. It's funny how close they come. They're almost like pets, but reindeer are not completely domesticated. Talk about reindeer being domesticated, but actually they soon reacclimatize into the wild. If we set these reindeer free, within a few days they'd return to the forest. The females keep their antlers long into the season. The males lose theirs in the winter and the females keep theirs until June, so they can protect their young from predators. 
Juliana and Boris actually lost some reindeer fawns they were rearing to stray dogs and bears. They are not that heavy. The females can weigh less than 100 kilograms. They are small members of the deer family, but they are adapted to the tundra. What do they give to them as a food? This is reindeer lichen. It's funny because it grows in France too. You find it in Brittany, in the peat bogs. But it's called reindeer lichen. It's not a plant, it's a cross between a fungus and a plant. That's a major part of their diet here in the tundra. The tundra has been stripped of part of its grassland and the ground underneath is permanently frozen. It's known as permafrost. This is the only food stuff they will find under the snow. It tastes of moss. Outwardly reserved, my hosts are the perfect inhabitants of the far north. Behind their reserve lies a big heart and a real love of reindeer and nature. And they live a simple, abstemious life. You have a relationship with your reindeers, a bit like um, parents and children. Yes, we give them milk from a bottle. We mollycoddle them so much that I can't leave them. Sometimes passers-by see fawns sleeping in our bed. <laughs> a reindeer sleeping here? They can't believe it. In our bed. <laughs> this is partly why I'm doing this and why I come on these trips. I wanted to meet animal farmers the world over, to explore the relationship between humans and nature through animals. These emotions are exactly the same as I experienced thousands of kilometres away. Here we are, having a coffee together, sharing a few photos and talking about our emotions, which are the same. Frustration in the face of death. Pleasure in bringing new life into the world and contributing to it. And our sometimes indescribably close relationships with animals. I find it fascinating how every farmer I meet tells me the same stories I've experienced in different circumstances. Rearing animals doesn't mean owning them. It means taking care of them, observing them and accepting them. These people have been so welcoming to a stranger like me who has reared animals which are completely different to theirs. People who live with animals and grow to love and respect them will always understand one another. I've been picked up by Genia and her friend Alexis, who are both reindeer keepers. They round up the reindeer and sort them out. Apparently, they have a surprise for me. Here, the only way to cross the tundra in winter is on a snow bike. The trip is going to take several hours, so I need to wrap up warm. I'm hoping we'll see some wildlife. That's a ptarmigan, otherwise known as a snow partridge. It's a member of the chicken family. The Latin name is lagopus, meaning hare's foot. This ptarmigan's feet are covered in feathers. It's beautiful. And in summer it is brown. Its feathers change colour. Здравствуйте. Реми. Очень приятно. Реми. Очень приятно. Реми. Nice to meet you. Wow. What is that? Those are our winter clothes. They make clothes out of reindeer skins. And this, what is it? It's a reindeer's forehead. It's for the boots. So the people here dress in reindeer skins from head to toe. It's lined with leather. You, you made it? No, the women in the village made it. It's like a second skin for them. The reindeer keeper's house is amazing. It's lovely how they live in such close contact with the reindeer. They love them and protect them, but they use them too. They have no qualms about skinning them and using their skins and their meat and their milk. There is a symbiotic relationship between humans and animals. It's beautiful and becoming quite rare in this world. It's not common to see people living that close to animals. There's nothing extraordinary about it. It's a way of life and a job for me. I've worked here for 
25 years, and I've got no complaints. You're very courageous. <laughs> Why courageous? There's, there's nothing to be afraid of here. The bears hibernate and there are no wolves. They're asleep now. But they won't wake up until April. There have been more of them these past few years. And they're much more cunning than they used to be. It's funny, because here I am, in Lapland in Russia, and the stories I'm hearing remind me of the stories from my ancestors in the Pyrenees. Several centuries ago, life in the mountains and in remote areas of France resembled life here today. There are lots of bears here, and bears are dangerous. They say they are getting ever craftier, making off with their baby reindeer, which are their livelihood. Humans live off reindeer here. They say the bears are a curse and that they have to fight them, and yet they live among them. Do you think we can go to see the reindeer? We're going to leave the Isba, pick up Genia, and go to see the reindeer. Okay? The reindeer have been here. You can see their hoof prints in the snow and their antler prints from where they bent down to reach the lichens. Ah, reindeer, yes. They call them and they come. Here is the first one now, the leader. They have brought treats for them. Vladimir, the reindeer man. So crazy, so crazy. Thousands of reindeer. This is my holy grail. Amazing. Incroyable. These are real tundra reindeer. It's incredible. Wait. They're a bit shy, and yet they want to come over. Incredible. White reindeer are shorter and a bit fatter. Brown reindeer are definitely closer to the phenotype of the first wild reindeer, which were brown. This one is less than a year old. Reindeer fawns aren't born with speckled coats like roe deer. When they are born, they are the color of the tundra. Half cream and half dark gray and brown. You can see the antlers starting to push through on the animal, which is less than a year old. Amazing. And those feet, which are so well adapted to the terrain with their broad hooves. Adapting to the cold makes reindeer stockier and more short-legged. It stops them losing heat. There used to be reindeer in France. They were painted on cave walls by prehistoric men. There was even an age of the reindeer that had nothing to do with Sami culture. It was the Magdalenian. Reindeer were so central to human civilization back then that the period was named after them. As with the Samis today, reindeer played a huge role in the culture of our French ancestors when the climate was so much colder there. Reindeer are sociable creatures and are often found in large groups, which allows them to confront predators and migrate in the event of harsh weather conditions. Like a silvery brown wave following its instinct, watching the herd ripple and swirl is enough to make your head spin. Vladimir, Vladimir it's deep here. C'est quoi ça? What is that? Do you see? Like this. My first lesson in lassoing. I can in Sami. It's miles away. I'm getting closer. <laughs> you didn't throw it right. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Ready? See That's it. Yeah. No, not like that. It's funny. These guys aren't 15 anymore, but they're loving this. Not bad. <laughs> they love being in contact with the reindeer, feeling their strength. Yes. Okay. Do you think that uh, in, uh, I don't know, in uh, 30 years, the, the culture of the reindeer will survive? Uh, how do you see this, this future? I think the culture will survive here. We keep traditions alive and honor memories. However, I know that in Finland and Norway, they no longer use reindeer for transport. So they've asked us to teach them how to make sleighs and tame reindeer. There's nothing to beat reindeer on snow. They can go where cars and snow bikes can't. They can swim and cross any terrain. For Laplanders, it seems reindeer will always rule. Whatever is going on elsewhere in the world, they will not change. The Isba may look austere, but kindliness reigns. A wooden cube in the tundra makes the perfect den for men, women and reindeer to share. Not far away, Nadiejda, one of the last Sami shamans, is in a frenzy. I meet her between the snow and the flames. What does this Sami soul have to say about what links humans to the nature surrounding them? Was it what you call conversation with spirits of the, of the forest? No. Yes, it's a dialogue with several types of spirit. With the spirit of nature, with the spirit of fire, with the spirit of the forest, with your spirit, with the spirit of the universe, with all these spirits. Do you feel that uh, what nature enriches you and uh, feeds your soul in some way? No, it's not that it enriches me. We live in harmony with nature. Samis don't seek to be enriched. Our lives are dedicated to knowledge. We seek to acquire superior knowledge. Nadezhda, you know me, I, I came here in your country, in your place, in order to discover the link between uh, man and nature through the animal, and particularly the reindeer. Which advice would you give me to uh, reach my objective? You need to make sure it is reciprocal and an exchange. You cannot keep taking without giving anything back, otherwise nature will destroy you. <laughs> I have taken note of Nadiejda's advice and I'm going to leave her to her incantations, which will, I hope, bring good luck to the sleigh drivers and reindeer competing in the Festival of the North. It's the final day of my trip and I've come to the suburbs of Lover Zero to meet Andre, the sleigh driver competing in the reindeer race who was recommended to me. Quite a few reindeer farmers must live here. Andre, здравствуйте. Remy, как дела? Wow, breakfast. I get to sample a Nordic breakfast. Meanwhile, Andre, it has to be said, is not in the chattiest of moods. He is probably preoccupied with today's events. You think the weather is okay for today, for the, the race to happen? The weather is fine today. There's no snow or wind, it's just cold. Okay. It's time to go. Okay, let's go. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Very good salmon in the morning. Whoa. <laughs> it's quite bumpy. Andre is going to fetch his reindeer. They've spent the night here before today's race. We're about to see how they spend the night. We're finally going to see some racing reindeer. On va enfin voir les vraies reines de course. Bon, 
Apparently, this is where reindeer spent the night. It's funny. These are gregarious animals who roam in herds by day, but at night they split up, staying in sight of one another, but taking a tree each in this forest on the edge of the plain. Andre tells me that reindeer only suffer from the cold at minus 40. Anything above that, and they're fine. Why don't you use gloves? Because me, I am very cold. You, you don't feel the cold? It's not easy with gloves on. And no, I'm not cold. Of course, Samis don't feel the cold. They were born here. They are children of the tundra. They make everything by hand. Leather, decorations, sleighs. They are outstanding craftsmen. Animals are decorated in many different cultures, whether it's elephants in Southeast Asia, camels, dromedaries, horses, or reindeer here. We love decorating animals. We put nice colors on our dogs and braids in our horses' tails. And here, the reindeers wear colorful harnesses, collars and beads. I can see lots of little beads. This is all part of reindeer culture. And he's off! He's off! He's off! He's off! I can't ride alongside Andre or the reindeer will get tired, so I'm going to take a snow bike and meet him in the village. Back in town, I leave Andre and his reindeer to get into the right frame of mind for the race. I take the opportunity to wander around the market a stone's throw away from the racetrack. This is incredible. It's as if everyone is here to celebrate reindeer. There are reindeer toys, reindeer skins, and all sorts of reindeer kebabs for sale. There's even tinned reindeer, so there must be a reindeer farm here in Lover Zero. They have every style of reindeer antlers here. Isn't that incredible? It's crazy. They have so much reindeer memorabilia. There are lucky charms and pendants. This one is a slice of reindeer antler edged with reindeer skin with the lap flag on it. It's not bad. It's been marinated. The taste is somewhere between pork and mutton. Reindeer races are sacred for Sammies. They spend the whole day having fun and watching the races start, usually with their families. And is it, is it normal that people don't shout that much? It's to not disturb the reindeer or to not like disturb the pilots? Or... Reindeer are not like cars. With a car, you remain in control. Reindeer are wild animals, so they are unpredictable. Driving them is always a challenge because they can break away at any moment during the race and just run off. This is it. The start of the race has been announced. The reindeer are on tenterhooks, their eyes shining, their skin trembling and their muscles contracted. It's as if a whole herd was preparing to suddenly gallop off into the tundra. Andre has arrived. I'm going to see how he did in his race. They don't all start at once, but they're up against the clock, all trying to beat the record. <coughs> He's off. Andre? I'm going to see where Andre came in the race because I can see he's looking a bit crestfallen. She's about to announce his time. Andre, number eight, finished his race in two minutes, 42 seconds. He came second. I think he'll be a bit disappointed with that. But there you go. <laughs> 
That's the rule. The fastest wins. Andre, two. Andre, second place isn't bad. Oh, he's disappointed. No wonder. They came here to win after all. Last year he came first. He got all the honours. In some cultures, it's all just folklore, and the attitude is, it's all about the taking part. We're keeping traditions alive. Here, it's not like that. You take part to win. You want your reindeer to be the best. The Festival of the North. Well done, Andre. The Sami people are like winter in Lapland. Cold initially, sometimes even frosty, like snow to the touch but fascinating and warm once you spend a bit of time by their frosty sides. Like their reindeer, they are semi-wild, but once they come out of their shells, they are as tame as anything. I think I ended up being adopted by these northerners.